with the Islamic persecution or the Arabic persecution. If we go through our introduction, when we talk about martyrdom, the word martyrdom coming from a Greek word called martis. And martis is meaning literally to testify or to witness. The first use of this uh, word was uh, by the apostles of Christ when they witnessed to the new Christian faith. After that, the word was used to describe the confessors who suffered for the belief in our Lord Jesus Christ. And finally, it was used uh, to explain or to uh, indicate to who, those who were killed for the sake of their faith. For sure, we know that also the Lord Jesus Christ himself, he died on the cross according to the Christian belief. And that's why also we can call him as a martyr of, 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 of truth, for sure, because he died on the cross uh, on the hands of the Jews. Now we will talk about some of the numbers. Maybe, I know, maybe you like numbers. 70 million. 70 million, according to one of the scholars named David G. Barrett, 70 million is the approximate number of uh, martyrs that Christianity presented since the first century until the early 20th century. For sure, there are different numbers about that, but according to, as I said, David G. Barrett, which is one of the scholars, said this is an approximate number about the number of people that were uh, martyred for the sake of the Christian faith. For sure, this is a big number. Uh, another number is 100,000. This number was presented in a documentary by the famous British TV, television uh, channel BBC back in 2010. They said that around the world, there is yearly 100,000 people are killed because of their Christian faith. And this number was based on the statistics they performed between the year 2000 and 2010. So according to BBC, there are 100,000 people losing their lives worldwide every year because of their Christian faith. If we calculate this, we will find that approximately we have one martyr every five minutes. And this is a very big number for sure. Another number is 303. 303 indicates two, uh, has two uh, meanings. The first meaning, this is the year in which Emperor Diocletian started the great persecution from the Roman Empire against Christianity back in the early 4th century. And this is considered one of the most cruel uh, persecutions Christianity have ever faced. And this number also 303 indicates uh, the number of remembrance or commemorations of martyrs in the Coptic Synexarium. We have something in the Coptic Church called the Synexarium, which is a book containing the commemoration of the saints in different uh, uh, occasions, martyrs, uh, hermits, monks, patriarchs, normal lay people. And we have in the Coptic Synexarium, which is read every day in the liturgical prayers in the Coptic Church, we have 303 commemoration for martyrs. And if it is read every day in the church, and we have 365 years, so we can say more than 90% of the days of the church, we read about martyrs, which makes the Coptic church a church of martyrs. Because we, we remember the, the people who offered their lives on a daily basis in the liturgical prayers. And actually, this is not a surprise for Christians, because the Lord Jesus Christ, when he was on earth, he did not promise that they will, the Christians will have a luxurious life. No, on the opposite. He told them in the book of John, chapter 15, to verse 20, uh, and verse 20, he said, 
remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will all, they will keep yours also. So the Lord Jesus Christ did not promise us to have a luxurious life. We will be persecuted because of our Christian faith. The same also, he said in Matthew 24, then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake, but he who endures to the end shall be saved. And the book of John was written around the year 96 uh, AD, and the book of Matthew was written around the year 65 AD. So more than 2,000 years ago, almost 2,000 years ago, these words and these prophecies were, were told by the Lord Jesus Christ and they were fulfilled across history. So that's why we say that martyrdom is not something that we were surprised with. No, the Lord Jesus Christ himself was killed. He, his apostles were killed for their faith. And also a lot of Christians were subjected to the same persecution because of their faith and it is it has been fulfilled and has been fulfilling until now and we ask another question here so why martyrdom why people have to offer their lives for the sake of their faith actually there are a lot of reasons according to the bible as well one of them is pain is considered a fellowship with the suffering of the Lord. The Lord Jesus Christ himself died on the cross. He was crucified under Pontius Pilate, this Roman governor, back in the almost the year 30 AD. So whenever Christians were offering their lives, they were considering this as a fellowship to the suffering of the Lord. As St. Paul is saying is his epistle or letter to the Philippians, chapter 3 and verse 10, that I may know him, and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conform conformable unto his death. A second reason, Christians believe that the world is limited as compared to eternity. So if we live here on earth 100 years, 120 years maximum, no one can live more than this now. This is almost zero compared to infinity which is the eter eternal life that we were promised to live uh, after this life because we believe in the afterlife and as saint john is saying in his first letter chapter 2 and the world passes away and the lost thereof but he that does the will of god abides forever that's why christians were offering their lives cheaply because it is eventually will be the end. At the end, they know that they will go to eternal life. They will go to live in the kingdom of heaven with the Lord Jesus Christ. So if they lived here on earth 10 years, no matter, doesn't matter. 100 years doesn't matter. At the end, when we compare it to eternity, it is still so cheap or it is almost tending to zero. A third reason Christians believe that they are strangers to this world. Uh, as St. John said in his epistle, and we know that we are of God and the whole world lies in wickedness. So Christians know that they are coming here to earth or they were born to live for some era of time. And then they will go to the place meant to be for them from the beginning of the world, which is the kingdom of heaven. A fourth reason is that the world is evil and life in and in life there will be tribulations. And I believe we all suffer that. The world is evil. We have many wars everywhere. We have wars, we have famine, we have people cheating, we have people deceiving, we have sexual trafficking for children we have uh, uh, a lot of gangs a lot of wars so we know that the world is evil and 
in our life, every one of us is suffering tribulations. It could be in the form of persecution, it could be a form of disease, it could be in a form of starving, famine. So eventually, this will be no place, no good place to live in it. But we are seeking and looking for something that is beyond that, which is the kingdom of God in heaven. Also, we know that death in the Christian faith will lead to glory. Uh, as St. Paul has said in his second epistle to Timothy, it is a faithful saying, for we will, if we were dead with him, we shall also live with him. So this is our Christian faith. Death is not the end of the story. Death is the end of one chapter. But the eternal life is yet to come. Mortals as well are believed in the church that they are ranked on top of saints. And they have very special place in the kingdom of God. And mortals as well lives their lives are models to follow. As St. Paul is saying in his epistle to Hebrews, remember those who rule over you, who have spoken the word of God to you, whose face follow, considering the outcome of their conduct. And for all these reasons, Christians were offering their lives, and whenever there was a persecution, many people were running to offer their lives uh, graciously and uh with with a very uh welcoming heart they were not afraid of suffering they were not afraid of death because they know this is not the end but yet this is the one chapter ends and another one starts and the long of the second chapter is infinity or eternal life in the church in general, there are many types of martyrs. We can say that we have uh, three types of martyrs. First type, those who die for the sake of their faith. And this is for sure the most, uh, the majority of the people who died, they, they, are, they died for the sake of their faith. And for example, the, the, the 12 apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ, or actually 11 of them, because St. John died normally. But 11 of the 12 apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ died because of their faith. They were persecuted. They died for preaching that the Lord Jesus Christ was crucified and he rose from the dead on the third day. Defending their faith, for sure, they never have died for a lie. And they never offered their life for something that they did not see. But actually, they sacrificed their life because of something they witnessed and they saw and there were eyewitnesses on it and for sure in every persecution whether the roman the jewish the islamic whatever people were always persecuted because of their faith so this is a majority of the people who dies or offer their lives for the sake of their faith second type of martyrs is those who die for the sake of purity and we have some examples in the church history. For example, we have uh, the first one on the left, a martyr called Butamina. Butamina was a pure virgin martyr. When she was under persecution, she cried to the ruler, to the ruler saying, by the head of your emperor, do not let them remove my clothes and allow them to let me go to the tar pit with my clothes on then you will see the power to endure that christ whom you do not know will give you and actually butamina when she was taken they wanted uh, as you heard that she they, they will take her clothes off before um, she go to death but she refused and the soldier named basili this defended her and he gave her his clothes and was also he was martyred. Uh, the second example for this is a martyr called Theodora. And Theodora was a 17 years old virgin, and she was martyred with a soldier named Didymus, who saved her from the plot to shame her by the emperor's decree 
and to send her to a whore house. This was the cru cruelty of the Roman persecutions. They wanted to shame women as well before they kill them. We have a solid example also in the Coptic church history related to one martyr called Saint Veronica. Saint Veronica actually was a, a, a nun in a monastery in Egypt. And this happened in the 8th century, around the year 749. The soldiers of the Mar of Marwan, the Khalifa of Islam, came to the monastery of the virgins and they wanted to assault the girl and rape her because she was very beautiful. And actually, she managed to uh, deceive them and save her virginity and purity by uh, telling them that she have a special kind of oil and this oil if you anoint this oil around your neck this you will pr protect your neck and your body if you were hit by a sword and she told the soldiers okay you can try this on me first and she anointed her neck and she ordered one of the soldiers to uh, strike her neck with a sword and finally for sure she, she she her head was cut off but she died but yet she saved her purity and her virginity and this is a kind and with the church history books contains a lot of examples like this how christians managed to even die but not to be shamed or to uh, sacrifice their purity and their uh, virginity in case of girls as well. Uh, we have a third type as well of martyrs, those who die for the sake of dogma. Because in some times in the church history, there were some dogmatic debates between different segments or different uh, groups uh, of theologians. Unfortunately, some theologians who uh, were connected to power persecuted the weaker part and the part that does not have government protection and this is we have in history for example we have one of the saints called san macarius and he was um, he was martyred after defending his face after the council of chalcedon the council that uh, divided the church around the nature of christ in the year 451 AD. So these were the three types of martyrs that we have. Now we start to talk about the different persecution eras. And we start with the persecution by the Jews. Christianity, when it started, actually it started in Palestine and basically in Jerusalem after the resurrection of ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ the uh, apostles of christ started to preach the gospel and eventually many of the jews and the gentiles started to join christianity which irrigated the jews at that time and the, and the jewish authorities that's why they started to persecute the newly uh, born religion which is christianity and we have several examples about that. First of all, when we see that the day of Pentecost, the starting day of the church happened around 30 AD, the year 30 AD, we have the first martyr written in the Bible, in the book of Acts chapter seven, and his name was Saint Stephen. Saint Stephen was one of seven deacons who were selected by the apostles to serve the widows in Jerusalem. And because of his talking to the Jews and trying to convince them with the face of the Lord Jesus Christ, they stoned him and he died around the year 36 or 37 AD. So just the church was just beginning to flourish and to grow and the Jews started to persecute the newly born Christ, the new, the new, the new Christians and the, new, the newly born religion. After that, in the book of Acts chapter 12 as well, we have another incident where the Jews uh, managed to uh, 
uh, enrage the uh, authorities against the, the Christians and the apostles and King Herod at that time of, uh, ordered the martyrdom of St. James, son of Zebedee, the, the brother of St. John. And this happened around the year 43 or 44 AD. Later on, we have also the Jews killing St. James, the bishop, bishop of Jerusalem. They stoned him around the year 62 AD. And finally, Jerusalem was totally destructed, uh, was totally destroyed by uh, the uh, Roman uh, leader, uh, Titus in the year 70 AD, and after that, that we can say that the, the Jewish persecution ended because the city of Jerusalem itself was totally destroyed and the Jews escaped and they went to live in uh, many different places all over the world since this incident. Uh, and also Christians who were staying in Jerusalem left and they went also to live in other places until Jerusalem was rebuilt again and became a Christian city later on. So this was one era or one episode of persecution happened against the Christian faith from the Jews. Uh, now we move to persecution by the Romans. We have uh, the persecution of the Romans against Christianity happened actually on two phases. Phase one, Romans were uh, persecuting Christians as they are a Jewish sect. They considered the Christians as a Jewish sect uh, that is against the Jewish norm, and they persecuted him on this basis until mid second century. And starting from mid second century, the Romans realized that Christianity is a different religion that is not related to Judaism, and they started to point the persecution to Christians based on this. The Roman Empire persecuted the Christians on 10 different occasions under 10 different uh, Roman emperors. And we will go through quickly through those 10 persecutions. We have, uh, but before we do this, we go also to speak about why the Romans persecuted Christians. They persecuted Christians for several reasons. First of all, they saw Christians as atheists. Because, as you know, Christians believe God and the Trinity, the Lord Jesus Christ, Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And for sure, we say that God is a spirit. So God is not visible in a statue or in something. So the Romans used, used to worship uh, their gods and they made statues for them and so on. So they didn't see any visible God for Christians. That's why they thought that Christians are atheists based on that. Also the Romans saw the Christians as antisocial, haters of society, because Christians did not participate in the pagan festivals that were organized by the Romans. Also, they saw Christians as they are secretive, because they have their own assemblies, they have their communion, they have their sacraments, and Based on that, they started to ban the Christian assemblies in some places. The Romans as well thought, according to the uh, magicians and sorcerers and so on, that Christians were the cause of the decay of the Roman Empire. They saw that the Christian neglecting the old gods that made Rome strong was causing the decay of the Roman Empire. And at some point of time, especially by the end of the first century, there, there was something called the, the uh, worship of the emperor. Emperor Domitian or Domitian 
around the year 80, uh, 83 or 85, he declared himself as God. And based on that, everyone in the Roman Empire should show allegiance and should perform some ritual to offer some incense to the statues of the emperor. For sure, Christians refused to do that because this is against the religion. The Romans considered this as a lack of loyalty to the emperor as a god. And based on that, they considered Christians as uh, betrayers because they did not want to worship the statues of the emperor. Based on these reasons and others, the Romans started to persecute Christians. By the second century, because of the uh, toughness of the persecution, Christians were not able to identify themselves in big communities. They were not able to wear crosses because that was very difficult for them at that time. That's why the, Rome, the, the Christians started to use another symbol, which is a symbol of the fish. And fish in Greek is called excesis. So the word excesis is fish in Greek language. And when the Christians started to draw the symbol of the fish, they took the first letter or each letter of the word excesis, as you can see on the screen, and every letter of it was representing one word. So this letter represents the word Isos, which is Jesus. This letter represents Christos, Christ. This letter represents Theos, God. This letter represents Eos, Son. And this letter represents Sotir, or Savior. So that it became Isos Christos, Theos, Eos, Sotir, or Jesus Christ, God, Son, Savior. So by drawing the symbol of the fish or wearing it in their necks, the Christians declared their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ as the Son of God. And they used it instead of the crosses at the time of persecution. And maybe you will notice that many of the Christians are still using the symbol of the fish today so you can relate to uh, that this is returns back to the persecution, especially in the second century. Now we talk about the uh, persecution by the Romans in a more detail. As I, as I said, the Romans persecuted the Christ Christianity and the, or the church by 10 organized Roman persecutions under 10 different emperors. The first persecution was under Emperor Nero, this guy who burned the city of Rome. And this happened between the year 64 and 68 AD. And we remember at that persecution, the uh, martyrdom of two of the famous apostles, St. Peter and St. Paul in the year 67 AD. Second persecution un happened under the Emperor Domitian between the year 90 and 96 AD. And we remember at this persecution, the exile of St. John the Apostle, the last of the apostles to the uh, island of Patmos. The third persecution happened between the year 108 and 117 under Emperor Trajan. And uh, we remember at that time, the one of the famous martyrs, his name is St. Ignatius, the Bishop of Antioch, and St. Simeon, the Bishop of Jerusalem, were killed in this persecution. The fourth persecution under the Romans happened under Emperor Marcus Aurelius. If some of you watched the movie Gladiator, you can, in the first, uh, in first scene or second scene of the movie, there was one emperor who was an old man. This represented Emperor Marcus Aurelius. Marcus Aurelius persecuted Christianity between the year 162 and 181, and under it we remember one of the famous martyrs, his name was Saint Justin Martyr. The fifth persecution happened under Emperor Severus between the year 202 and 211, 
and we remember Saint Perpetua and Felicitas and the companions who were died, who were killed at Carthage. The sixth persecution under Emperor Maximus between the year 235-249, and uh, uh, this was we don't re we don't recall any of the major uh, uh, martyrs at that time except one of the famous martyrs his name was uh, San Valentinus and San Valentinus is remembered nowadays for Sa for the Valentine's Day in 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 February uh, because San Valentinus was a priest in Rome and uh, the emperor at that time banned the uh, Roman soldiers to get married. So San Valentinus uh, used to marry the uh, the soldiers and their wives secretly. And when the emperor knew he killed San Valentinus, that's why he is remembered as, as a saint of love or we have the Valentine's Day on 14th of February. By the year 249, we have the seventh persecution under uh, Emperor Decius. And this was uh, what we call the first imperial wide persecution. This happened in the whole empire. Before this, before this persecution, most of the persecutions were localized in some countries. But under Emperor Decius, we have uh, the uh, first imperial war persecution, and we remember one of the famous saints of the church. His name is Saint Philopatir, Philopatir Mercurius. As you see his image here, he has carrying his, he carries two swords. We call him in Arabic the one of the two swords of Abu Sufyan. He was martyred at that time. We have then the eighth persecution under Emperor Valerian, and we remember. This in this persecution, Saint Justina and Saint uh, Cyprian, uh, the Bishop of Carthage, who was uh, martyred in the year 258. And then we have the ninth persecution under Emperor Aurelian. Uh, this happened between 274 to 175. And finally, we have the tenth and the great persecution under Emperor Diocletian and Emperor Galerius between 303 and 311. We will dig deeper a little bit with this final persecution by the Romans, the great persecution under the under Diocletian. One of the church historians, famous church historians, his name is Eusebius of Caesarea, described how the Egyptians, the Copts, suffered during the great persecution. He said the following, such was the conflict of those Egyptians who contended nobly for religion entirely. Some offered their heads bravely to those who cut them off. Some died under the tortures, and others perished with hunger, and yet others were crucified. Some according to the method commonly employed for malefactors, others yet more cruelly being nailed to the cross with their heads downward and being kept alive until they perished on the cross was hunger. This is written in the Ecclesi Ecclesiastical History by Eusebius of Caesarea in the fourth century. So this shows that there were a great suffering under this great persecution of Diocletian between 303 and 311. The persecution of Diocletian, Emperor Diocletian, started in phases. Phase number one was in the March or March 303 when he commanded the destruction of churches, the burning of all scriptures, and the burning of all Christian gatherings, banning of all Christian gatherings. Then he, he issued a second edict in May uh, 303, sanctioning the imprison, imprisonment of the Christian clergy. Then he issued a third edict on, in, on September 303, demanding pagan sacrifices from the Christian clergy. And then in uh, November 303, he issued the fourth edict, demanding pagan sacrifices from all Christians. We remember in this uh, 
persecution that the Coptic Church offered more than 800,000 martyrs in those uh, eight or nine years, 303 to 311, under Emperor Diocletian and Emperor Galerius, the Coptic Church offered more than 800,000 martyrs. We remember them in the Coptic Synexarium in 184 commemoration and in 184 days across the year. Among the famous saints that offered their lives, or the martyrs that would offer their lives during the great persecution of the Ecclesian, we remember St. George, who uh, was martyred between the years 303 or 307. We remember St. Agnes of Rome. We remember St. Catherine of Alexandria. We remember St. Barbara. We remember St. Mina, the miracle worker, and he is Egyptian too. And we remember St. Uh, Peter, the last of the martyr, and he was the Bishop of Alexandria. And he was the last bishop to, to be martyred in the year 311. That's why we call him the last of the martyrs. Now we move to talk about a third era of persecution. After Emperor Diocletian died, and after Emperor Galerius died, and Emperor Constantine the Great took over the Roman Empire around the year 324, or before that also in the West, he stopped the persecution, and in the year 313, he declared something called the Edict of Milan, or the Edict of Religious Toleration. And since 313, the persecution stopped from the Romans and Christianity started to flourish and started to be born or to, to, to grow again. And Christians started to build big churches, cathedrals. They were a lot of people joining the monastic movement. Uh, there were the era of the ecumenical councils, the Council of Constantinople, 320, uh, sorry, Nicaea 325, Constantinople 381, and Ephesus 431. So Christianity flourished a lot after Constantine and the era of his descendants as well. And continued to do so, and the church had one faith, one unity, until we reached the year 451. In the year 451, we had the Council of Chalcedon, which divided the church into two groups, a group called the Chalcedonians, who accepted that the Lord Jesus Christ has two natures, and the group called the non-Chalcedonians, which accepted that the Lord Jesus Christ had one nature out of two combined natures, without separation, alteration, or confusion. This division in the church happened in the year 451, was followed by persecution, because the Chalcedonians, who agreed on the Council of Chalcedon in the year 451, had the power in their hands. The emperors were Chalcedonians. And accordingly, they started to persecute the opposite group, which is the non-Chalcedonians, and this happened in Egypt at least between the year 451 until the year 642, which marked the Arab conquest in Egypt. Um, quickly, uh, the, the Copts lived in several decades of tensions and persecutions, and the patriarchs of Alexandria were exiled. Many churches were closed, because the Christians of Egypt refused to follow the Chalcedonian creeds. We have, for example, under Emperor Justinian in the year 553, he ordered the closure of the non-Chalcedonian churches. He ordered, he ordered to remove the uh, Coptic Christians from the army, from the government, and he banned the uh, ordination of priests and bishops, trying to uh, completely uh, kill or vanish the non-Chalcedonian groups in Egypt. Uh, and this is, as I said, happened in the sixth century. 
There were also some revolts happened against the non-Calcedonians, against then one of the famous is one happened uh, against Emperor Maurice between the year 582 and 602. So the 200 years followed the Council of Chalcedon, the church in Egypt, basically, because it was a non-Calcedonian church, suffered also from persecution caused by, sorry to say, their fellow Christians who believed in the Council of Chalcedon and its decrees. Now we move to the, the last era or the last uh, era of persecution, which is the persecution by the Arabs or by the Muslims, which is started by the Arabic conquest to Egypt in the year 642 until we can say today, uh, because Egypt is still under the uh, Islamic rule. Egypt used to be a Christian country between the late fourth century until we can say mid ninth century so for, for five complete centuries the majority of egyptians were christians until the arabs started to grow and islam started to grow in egypt and demographically became muslims became the majority and christians became minority as we currently speak today we can say that muslims in egypt represents around 80 percent of the population and egypt and the christians uh, uh, we can say cons uh, forms the other 20 percent of population and uh, when the arabs came to egypt the church started to suffer several persecution under the different islamic era i cannot say that the complete 1400 years were persecutions i cannot say that this this is not scientific this is not this is not academic but i can what i can say is that the church suffered some persecutions on different occasions and because they were hated in a little a little bit in some of the teachings of the muslims who came to egypt against the christian faith that's why the church suffered several persecutions but i cannot say that the whole complete uh, 1400 years were full of persecution. This is, will not be fair and this is not, cannot be academic. Let's go through some of the main incidents that uh, the Ch Coptic Church faced during, after the Arabic conquest. First of all, the Egyptians, the Copts, used to speak Coptic as the common language and they used to use Greek as uh, the official language. When the Arabs came to Egypt, they suffered. They couldn't talk Coptic for sure. They came from uh, Saudi and they were speaking Arabic and Arabic is the language of Quran. So they forced the Arabic language and officially make it to replace the Coptic language in the year 706. And this is forced the Christians at that time, the Copts to start to learn the new language because elsewhere or else they, they wouldn't be able to deal with the government they wouldn't be able to trade they wouldn't be able to do any official work and some of the muslim governors persecuted the copts for not using the arabic as the language of dialogue this happened at some time as well in the year between the year 828-829, the body of St. Mark, the evangelist, the one who preached Christianity in Egypt, was stolen and was taken to Venice and still there until today, Venice in Italy. By the year 840-850, the majority of Egyptians became Muslims. The, the, the demography in Egypt changed. 51% became Muslims and this is due to many, many different reasons. Among them is persecution. Among them is the huge amount of taxes which is called Gizya, that was enforced on the non-Muslims, on the Christians. And many of the Christians were not able to pay. So the alternative were to change or to convert to Islam. By the year 961, 963, 
the city of Cairo was established and the uh, Azhar Mosque was also founded. Between the year 976 and 979, we witnessed in the history of the Coptic Church a miracle called the miracle of Mount Muqattam. And this has a story where the Arabic Khalifa at that time, Al Mu'izz al Din Allah Al Fatimi, uh, through his uh, uh, palace and some of the ministers, one of them had uh, Jewish origins, he found a verse in the Bible telling, if you have faith, you will tell this mountain to move from this place to the other, and uh, the mountain will follow. And the, the Jewish minister came to the Khalifa and told him, if the Christian faith is correct, order them to fulfill this verse. And actually, this was a great uh, turbulence for the for the Christian Egyptians at that time. The patriarch of the time, his name was Abraham ibn Zara. He uh, he ordered three days of fasting in the church, and everyone went and they prayed. And with the prayer, the Mount Muqattam really moved from his previous location to the current location. And this is. Uh, recorded in the books of the historians. For sure, the Muslim historians did not record the incident itself, but they recorded that the Mount Muqattam in his current place, uh, or it, it has, a, had a, has a previous place when they described Egypt, they described the location of the Mount Muqattam is in a, in a place different than the one we have in it today, and which again proves the authenticity of this miracle. Between 996 and 1021, there were severe persecutions in the era of Al-Hakim, Al-Hakim Ba'amr Allah, and he ordered that the tongues of the non-Arabic uh, speakers to be cut. He orders the banning of uh, uh, planting uh, uh, grapes, because grapes were used to uh, produce the uh, wine or the, uh, the or, or, or the um, fruit, the, the the juice of grapes that we used in uh, the liturgical prayers of the Coptic Church during the era of the Arabs we can say between the 7th century and the 12th century, we have a lot of martyrs. We can remember of them, one of them is called Saeed ibn Katib al-Firghani. This guy was an engineer and he built one of the greatest mosques in Egypt and he was Christian. The mosque's name, mosque's name is uh, Ahmad ibn Toulon's mosque. And uh, because of the building of this mosque, before he built it, the Ahmed ibn Tulun, the governor, he wanted to build the biggest mosque in Egypt, and to do so, he would uh, destroy many of the churches to take the columns of the churches to build them the the mosque. But when the Coptic engineer Saeed heard about that, he offered the uh, Arabic ruler that he would build the mosque for him was a, was the minimal number of columns and he did so and after that the the, the muslim governor uh, killed him we remember also one of the saints his name was saint bestaurus or saint uh, salib the new salib or salib al-jadid and he was uh, killed in the time of consul ghuri the fatimid uh, ruler of egypt we remember also saint bishnona who was burned at the stake, and we remember Saint Sidhom Bishay. This his incident happened in the 18th century uh, in uh, Domietta in Egypt, and his body is still kept uh, as it is. It, it did not. Uh, it was not absolved until today. We have also martyrs in the 20th and the 21st century. Because Egypt, starting from the 70s, 1970s, and maybe until 
2014 Egypt was basically ruled by the Muslim Brotherhood and the Muslim Brotherhood had their allegiance and their alliance with many of the terrorist groups all over the world so they hated Christians and they persecuted Christians in Egypt and unfortunately the, govern the government was a little bit lean on that that's why we remember in the 20th and the 21st century a lot of uh, Christians that were killed in Egypt because of the Christian faith. Many of the incidents, for example, we have one incident in Al Zawiya Al Hamra in Cairo, 1981. We have Asyut, 1992. Abu Qurtaz, these are cities in Egypt, 1997. Alexander, uh, Al Kush in, in Upper Egypt, 1998. Alexandria 1990 and, uh, and 2006, uh, Naga Hamadi on the eve of Christmas in 2010, and Maspiru, the television building in front of it in 2011. And we also remember after the Muslim Brotherhood took power and they were removed by the revolution in Egypt in 2013, they attacked the, the Christian churches they burned more than 80 Christian churches all over Egypt and they bombed some of the churches in Tanta and in uh, Abbasiyah in Cairo. And uh, we also remember the, uh, the martyrs of Libya and this has happened in Libya in 2015 where uh, there were some a group of workers, Egyptian workers, were, were, were working in Libya and they were uh, kidnapped by ISIS. And ISIS uh, broadcasted, uh, slaying them at the coast of the Mediterranean Sea. And this happened in February 2015. And uh, we remember those 15 martyrs. Uh, because they witnessed for the Christian faith in, uh, in front of ISIS, this uh, uh, terrorist group. Finally, the church is persecuted, but yet triumphed. We say that uh, martyrs have a very important place in the kingdom of heaven as i said the epistle of hebrews chapter 12 says therefore we also since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses and witnesses here means martyrs let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily in in ensnares us saint john chrysostom one of the church fathers in the fifth century he said that the feast of the martyrs have a great effect on Christian congregation because they strengthen them against the works of the devil and protect them against the evil thoughts and give them great internal peace. Uh, teacher Tertullian, one of the famous church fathers in the third century, said the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. So by the blood of the martyrs, the church grew. And this is, in fact, the truth because the, the Christianity faced so many persecutions across centuries, yet it's still one of the most growing religions in the world until today. The life of the martyr is a living Bible, and his martyrdom proves that Christianity is real because somebody is dying for his faith and is not facing death because he believes in the eternal life and the blood of martyrs changed history. Actually, this is true. Uh, finally, we, we can take a look at this map. This map is, we have two parts in this map. The lower part of this map is, uh, this is a world map. And according to the world watch list, which is a famous, uh, uh, activist groups in the United States, they say that these in the lower part of the map, the places, hot places in the world where they have persecution against Christianity. 
So it is marked in different colors, yellow, orange, pink, red, and, and so on. So the more the color is darkened, the more persecution is. And this is back in 2011. So we can see the least persecution is in this, in Asia here in, in Russia, for example, in India, this is the least persecution. And the persecution become more intense in these Arabic countries in North Africa, and then become more intense here in these countries like Iran, like Pakistan, and so on. And it become more dark and more deeper and deeper in countries like Somalia, the Saudi Arabia uh, at that time. This is back in 2011. Now we look at the upper part of the map. The upper part of the map shows the annual rate of change to Christianity in the year 2010. So we will monitor that almost in the same countries that we have the deepest persecution, we have Christianity is growing more and more. So the persecutors, when they think that they are killing Christianity, by killing the Christian followers, unfortunately, this is giving uh, the opposite result. Whenever people see other people offering their lives, and they are not afraid, and they are strong when they offer their lives freely for their faith, they believe that those people are really believing and are really convinced of what they believe and Christianity grow even more and more in the countries that have the most severe persecution according to these statistics back in 2010-2011. Finally, I would like to conclude with the verse from the book of Revelation chapter 6 and the verses from 9 to 12 when St. John is saying, when he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice saying, how long, O Lord, holy and true, un until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth. Then a white robe was given to each of them and it was said to them, that they should rest a little while longer until both the number of the full of servants will be completed as they were completed. So the martyrs are now, according to Christian faith, living in the kingdom of God in heaven, and we look upon them for their intercession and for prayers for us on earth and we look again to meet them when we move from this life to the eternal life i thank you for your patience and thank you so much this was the end of my presentation thank you so much mr Fed. Do we have uh, questions? Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Eddie is uh, raising his hand. Uh, hello, sir. Actually, I want to understand about that. Uh, the uh, Christian has the three father, soul, and Holy Spirit. But actually, I'm confusing. Uh, I have a confusion in that. Uh, the what is the Jesus Christ belief actually? Because uh, today we uh, anywhere just a concise way to watch the Christianity. There is a three different like uh, Catholic, Coptics, and Protestant. Even the Christianity is already increasing day by day and growing the faith as well. And who the and whom they are killing right now? They are Christian already or something else? Okay, so uh, so Mr. Eddie, if I understand your question, you're asking about the Christian denominations, right? 
Yes, yes, actually, Christian denominations. And yes. one of my question is related to the Jesus Christ. What what was their original faith in the Christianity, and how it was become now? The three different sects. I don't rem I don't understand the first part. If you can explain further. Actually, the first part is that the what is the actually believe the Jesus Christ? What was their faith in Christianity? Okay. Because oh, for yes. the, further the uh, further the uh, division of three sects of the Christianity, like okay. Coptic okay. and Roman, and I got your question. The, I got I got your question. Okay, so all the Christians all over the world, whether they are Orthodox, Catholic, or Protestant, share some of the basic beliefs. They have some differences for sure, but not on the core beliefs. There are five core beliefs every Christian all over the world share. The first belief is the incarnation of the Lord Jesus Christ. That Jesus Christ was the Son of is the Son of God, and he was incarnated. He took flesh and he lived among us on earth, uh, that he may save us from the sin of Adam and Eve. This is the first core belief. Every Christian in the world believe in that. The second, uh, uh, second one is the redemption of Jesus Christ. The redemption of Jesus, Jesus Christ died on the cross to save us from sin, and he gave us his life that we may receive redemption and we may receive the eternal life. The third core belief is the unity of God and the, and the Trinitarian, the Trinitarian uh style of god so we believe that we have we believe in one god god of three hypostases father son and the holy spirit and father son and holy spirit is one god with the same essence existed all the time since the beginning of the world till the end of the world the fourth core belief is the divinity of the lord jesus christ jesus christ is god Yes, he lived on earth as a human being, but also he was God in the flesh. So he was a complete human and he was a complete God. And the fifth core belief is the eternal life. We believe that there is an afterlife and there is a place where the good people who lived uh, in a good moral life on earth will go to the kingdom of heaven and those people who did evil on earth and committed a life of lust and uh, sin will gain, will go to the eternal punishment in Hades, the place that were originally prepared for Satan and his uh, armies. So five core beliefs every Christian in the world believe in, whether Orthodox, Catholic, or Protestant. Uh, again, I repeat them, the incarnation, the uh, redemption of Christ and his salvation, one God, unity of God in a Trinitarian way, and the divinity of Christ and the uh, eternal life. Now we move to differences. So what are the differences between Orthodox, Catholic, and Protestant? This is a big topic, but let me summarize it. The, the, the Christianity had one faith and had one church it was one church until the fifth century in the fifth century specifically on the council of chalcedon that happened in the year 451 some groups represented the nature of christ that he has two natures uh, combined in one person or one hypostasis another group expressed the same in a different way saying that jesus christ had one nature out of two natures combined without separation, alteration, or confusion in one person. And at that time, due to a lot of politics, they, they didn't manage to reach an agreement. That's why the church split in the year 451 to two groups, one called the Chalcedonian, who adopted the two-nature theology, and one is called the non-Chalcedonian, which adopted the one-nature theology. Later on in the 11th century, within the Chalcedonian group, the, the Church of the West added one word to the Orthodox Creed, 
related to the procession of the Holy Spirit. They said the Holy Spirit is proceeding from the Father and the Son, while the Eastern part said it proceeded only from the Father, according to the Bible. Based on this difference, the Chalcedonian churches as well, they split it again in the 11th century, in the year 1054, into two parts. The Western part was called themselves the Catholic Church, and the Eastern part called themselves the Roman Orthodox or the Eastern Orthodox. The third division happened in the 16th century after some of the uh, corruptive, we can say, uh, use of spirituality within the Catholic Church, a group of people protested against these corrupted practices and they split themselves out and they called themselves the Protestant groups based on the teachings of Martin Luther, John Calvin, and King Henry VIII of England. So these were the three major divisions that happened in the church, resulting in what we call today Orthodox and Catholicism and Protestantism. But again, the three groups believe that they share the five core dogmas about Christianity and about Jesus Christ. I hope I answered your question. Uh, okay, sir. Uh, but one question I have, uh, one more question. Sure. Uh, what, what about the prophet Joseph uh, in the Bibles described? Can you explain a little bit? It is related to Christian or it is uh, another religion's belief? Prophet Joseph? The, yes, yes, Prophet Joseph. You mean Joseph, the son of Jacob? Yes, yes, absolutely. Joseph, the son of Jacob, was one. We, we cannot say he is a he as a prophet. He is one of the righteous people who lived in the Bible because he lived a pure life, and he was the son of one of the twelve sons of Jacob, one of the three major fathers in Judaism: Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and. In the book of Genesis, uh, I believe starting maybe from chapter 39 until chapter 50, we have the story of Joseph who left his brothers and he was sold by his brothers to the Egyptians. He lived in Egypt and then he ruled as a second man in Egypt, saving Egypt from famine that happened at that time. <clears throat> We're in Christianity, we see that he was just a symbol for the Lord Jesus Christ in many different aspects. He was just a symbol. One of the symbols that he was sold by his brothers. The Lord Jesus Christ was sold by Judas Iscariot to the Jews. We say that Joseph lived a pure life when he had the chance to commit adultery with the wife of the uh, of uh, Potiphar, or the head of the, the interiors in Egypt, he said, how can I do You know the story. Ba Bani Julekha, I think. Julekha, yes. Potiphar and Julekha, no? Yes. Yes, exactly. That's why we said he refused the sin and he lived a pure life. Again, when he met his brothers, again, when he was in power, he forgave his brothers and reconcile with them. We say that the Lord Jesus Christ came to earth to reconcile heaven and earth, and he, he provided forgiveness for everyone. When Joseph was in Egypt, he saved Egypt from the famine. We say that again also he's a symbol for the Lord Jesus Christ who saved humanity from the spiritual famine. So we can say there are resemblance between Joseph and Jesus Christ, and as Christians, we took him as a symbol of the Messiah to come. This is what how we perceive Joseph in the Old Testament. Any other questions? <laughs> Uh, 
Um, <clears throat> thanks a lot, uh, Mr. Fadi, for this wonderful session. Uh, you really made a great uh, journey from the beginning of Christianity until now. Now it's a different you. era of persecution. Thanks a lot, Mr. Fadi. Uh, thank I'm you, everyone. Glad. Yeah, I was I was pleased that I was here today, and thank you for your time and patience, and thank you, Abuna, again for inviting me. It's our pleasure, uh, Mr. Fadi, and wish to see you uh, always with us. Uh, I just wanted to clarify one more point, uh, like about uh, the question of Mr. Eddie, that uh, about the differences between the Christian groups. Uh, we want to say that from the beginning, Jesus Christ meant to have only one church, uh, because we believe the church is the body of Christ, and Christ is the head of the church. And of course, for one head, there should be one body. But unfortunately, some churches deviated from the original face of the original church founded by Jesus Christ himself and the Holy Apostle. And as uh, Mr. Fadi explained how the Roman Catholic Church separated from the one church, the Orthodox Church, and then later on due to these deviations within the Catholic Church, again, split happened in the Protestant Church uh, because of the, these um, deviations of the Catholic Church. And even till now, in the Protestant Church, now we see thousands of uh, Protestant Church dividing day after day. And, you know, you see there is no reference point at, at these churches, that there is no uh, reference in interpretation of the Bible. That's, that's why each body understands the Bible in his own way and start his own church. Uh, by this way, uh, there is a great deviation from the truth. But we, as, as Christians, as Orthodox Christian, we believe that we cannot separate the Bible from the church and we cannot understand the Bible outside the church. And the church should be as a reference in our understanding of the Bible and the interpretation uh, and commentaries of the church fathers in the in the early church for the division are, are always our reference for understanding and also the church life, how uh, how the church uh, experienced its face and exercised its face. What was the rituals of the church? All this will let us understand uh, the, the true understanding and the right understanding of the Holy Bible. So uh, we need to uh, highlight that Orthodox Christianity simply means the original church before the division, before any kind of division which happened throughout the history. Thanks to God, there is still one church continuing the same original face as uh, delivered by Jesus Christ himself to the Holy Apostles and as taught by our uh, church fathers. And this is very important to stick to the roots. And this is one of the reasons why we are uh, like introducing this course, because we want to tell the people that uh, there is a kind of Christianity which is original, which is pure, uh, because in Christianity, we always want to go back to the roots because Christianity is founded by Jesus Christ, our Lord, means founded by God himself. So it is perfect from the beginning. So in Christianity, the old is always gold. That's why we are having this course to tell, uh, to tell you, our brothers and sisters, about the original Christianity, because this will also affect uh, our uh, salvation. Because the right faith means the right, uh, the right uh, belief and means the right destiny. And thank you very much, Mr. Fadi, again, and thank you all for your patience uh, and your uh, understanding for this wonderful uh, session today. Thank you so much for giving wonderful explanation on this Thank you, dear. Uh, okay, let us conclude by prayer in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you for this session today. We thank you for the knowledge you have given to us about the church, about Christianity, about how Christianity was persecuted. Until now, Christianity are persecuted because this is it's always like that, that the light is hated from the darkness and the righteous is hated from the evil. So we thank you, our Lord Jesus Christ. Please lead us, lead our ways to you, lead our ways to the truth, because this is what we want. We need the truth in a confusing world full of different world views, each claiming that they are true. But of course, we know that the truth is one and the truth is you, our Lord and God. Amen. Thank you, Father. Thank you, everyone.